Well, I think we're here now, everybody. So good evening and welcome to another World War II TV show. This, I think I'm on live now. Yep, we're live. So this is part two of our Operation Charnwood or the Liberation of Caen show. Uh, we have me and three French guests today. So yesterday it was me and three British guests. Today I have three French guests, which makes sense because we're talking about a city in France. So about time we had some representation from this side of the channel. So joining me today, I'll put the onto the gallery view again. We have Karine is our expert. Karine Poulard has been a guide since 1990. Is that right, Karine? Yeah. Oh, yes, at least. Well, crazy. And, and most of the tour guides in Normandy owe some of their training to Karine. She's trained a ridiculous amount of the tour guides of Normandy. And we have Gwen Pierre out on site in the Chateau uh, in, in Caen. So there's Gwen's feed right now. Good evening, Gwen. Thanks for joining us. How are you? Hi. Fine and you? Good evening. We're very well, yeah. So uh, that's Gwen's view of the wonderful sunlit city of Caen this evening. And we have, of course, Mag, my other half, who is a little bit further away from uh, Gwen. She's near the church there and um, we'll be coming to both Gwen and Mag as the show goes on. So let's start. For those who are watching last night, we talked about Operation Charnwood, and I'm going to share through. I've got lots of lots of photos to share with you today, so bear with me. So here's a map of Charnwood. And yesterday, if you're calling, if you're watching yesterday's show, we did the fighting over here near Buron and Galmanche of the uh, 59th Staffordshire Division, and then further south, the HLI moving this way in. Well, today we're in the city of Caen. We're kind of skipping the little bit north of Caen, because that has now been swallowed up by the, the modern city. So there's not much authenticity in that area there. And today we're going to be pick, particularly focusing on the British 3rd Division coming in this way from the northeast. And we're mentioning, of course, the Canadians coming in from the west over here. And I'll show, show you what our, our roving reporters are going to be doing today. So I'll show another screen now. This is a Google Earth image I created today showing um, the city of Caen, basically. And Gwen is currently over here, if you follow my mouse, in the Chateau grounds in the middle of the city. And he'll be showing us the third division monument a bit later on. And Mag is over here by the Pharmacie du Progrès, which will tell you why that's significant a little bit later on. And Mag is going to be working her way west via these streets around here through Caen, showing us various locations that are interesting. Gwen is moving kind of south. He's going to be going off south towards the River Orne and talking about um, uh, the bridges over the, the river there. And Gwen, is, although he's from Brittany, has been living in Caen the last few years and has particularly done some research in the Vaucelles area and found some lovely bullet holes for to show us later on. And Karine is going to be our main expert talking about the city of Caen and the occupation and liberation and things like that. So I'll show that... Um, Charmwood map once again, and I will come to you very shortly, Karine. It isn't just me talking, don't worry, I'm just doing the introduction. And um, the unit we're focusing on today is 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 personal to me because it's my great uncle's unit, the second battalion Royal Ulster Rifles. And I will show it, and there may or may not be some members of my family watching this. My mum and dad are probably watching it, and maybe Cyril, my uncle Cyril's uh, family are watching it as well. So I'll just show you a photo of, of my uncle. Um, this is him. Uh, got lots of photos to scroll through today, so bear with me. This is my great uncle Cyril in uh, recently commissioned subaltern's uniform with his Sam Brown and his standard service dress cap there. That was an early photo, maybe 1943. And by the time of the June the 6th landings, he was commanding 15 platoon of C Company of the 2nd Battalion Royal Star Rifles. And this was his platoon. Um, and if you notice, for those watching who are interested in uniforms, because they're a Northern Irish unit, they wear their general service caps pulled down to the left, which is kind of the French way, because they're Irish. So they are wearing it as a corbine, the Irish uh, headgear. So my uncle Cyril is great uncle Cyril is in the middle of there wearing a, gen, uh, a field service cap and all his men, his sergeants and men have the, the, the general service cap pulled down to the left hand side because they are Irish. Although in my great uncle's case, he was actually from West London and happened to be a commissioned into that regiment. And they were part of 9th Brigade of the British 3rd Division. We'll be talking a lot about my great uncle during the course of the show. So 
I'll go back to once again to the Operation Charmwood photo. Just bear with me again. It takes a bit of time to get the photos up. So the British Third Division have been moving down through Libisi Wood, which has no, now been kind of swallowed up a lot of it by Ouville St. Clair, which is where Kareen is, is from. And they would had a tough time moving out that morning because of the bombardments and the dust and lots of Germans and, and the, the loss of life from the previous day on July, July the 8th. Part one of Charm. And I'm going to be reading a few quotations from my great today. And I believe me, I will come to our guests very shortly. I'm just doing the rambling introduction. And and we're going to, you know, as I said, well, our camera teams are in the city of Con. But as my great uncle and the Royal Oswald was moving down the July the 8th, this is what he said about the, the, the decay and destruction around the area here north of the city. He said this. By this time, I had become inured to the sight of torn and mutilated bodies. But even so, my stomach turned when I saw two soldiers who had fallen in front of a tank lying in the path of its tracks, completely flattened, their bodies split open, revealing bones and red glistening flesh. So that's uh, a pretty um, somber reminder of the loss of life and the bombardments. And that rectangle on the map there was the area where the heavy bombers had dropped their payload or intended to drop their payload. It, some of it missed on the morning of July the 8th. And so coming in this way from the north of town, there was lots of destruction from the uh, the bombing the day before. So um, anyway, let's go into Caen and we'll, we'll ha I'll put ca uh, Gwen's camera feed on because Gwen is on the, the ramparts of the, of the chateau there showing the city of Caen, which um, is a modern city in some ways. Now lots of modern construction. I'll turn to, uh, to Karine in a minute. I, I keep saying I will. And I'm just gonna show you one more image then I'm gonna, then I'm gonna hand over to Karine. This is a 1946 map of Caen. Now the orientation is slightly odd on it because north is actually kind of to the, to the top right. So it's not quite um, uh, north-south correct. But the red images on the map are the areas, if you look at the, the, the legend here on the map, on the bottom left hand corner, it means it was 90 to 100% destroyed. Pink means 60 to 90% destroyed. And then the white stuff was the area of Caen that hadn't been destroyed. So when you look at that map there, you can see that the central part of Caen, particularly this sort of the, the suburban shopping area all around here, was almost entirely destroyed in World War II. The, the, the Western bit over here had uh, not suffered quite so badly. And uh, the Eastern part over here hadn't suffered so badly, which is why in the morning of July the 9th, the first patrols of the Royal Ulster Rifles, which were part of A Company, were sent out to the East and West. So one patrol under A Company came out to the East this way, via Rue de Canix this way, to kind of probe into Con over here somewhere. And another patrol went round on the west and they came in this way to the uh, San Julian area and they were just kind of checking and feeling their way in. But as it happened, the main Royal Ulster Rifles push came pretty much due south down the Rue de Livron from uh, the Lebesy Wood area. And that's where they had to contend with all this incredible rubble and the destruction. And we'll talk about that later on. So I will finally shut up and let Con, uh, Karine speak. So um, thank you for joining us, Karine. And uh, it's, it's wonderful to have you because you're a proper uh, local girl to tell us about this city. So how had the occupation been for the people of Caen uh, from 1940 to up until 1944? So good evening, everybody. And um, it's interesting to um, talk more about the occupation of Caen because of um, most people don't know so well. Uh, we uh, talk a lot about what happened on the beaches or in big battles where Americans fought or, you know. But in Caen, the occupation was not pleasant at all. Um, the resistance in Caen and around Caen was quite active. And there has been a lot of sabotages of telephone cables, often very close to the headquarters of the uh, German commandant tours downtown Caen, and the people of Caen were often punished. Um, many men were requisitioned and had to spend the whole night uh, by groups, one after another, to guard. And uh, um, after another sabotage at Iran that you heard about, when some uh, French resistance members have sabotaged the railway and a lot of German soldiers died, a lot of um, people who were supposed to be resistance or close to the resistance 
uh, communist Jewish people uh, were executed as a punishment and many others were captured and uh, some were deported and the others were imprisoned. So the occupation was not pleasant. Um, and the city um, tried to, um, I mean, people of the city, many of them were close to, um, I mean, Anglophile, you know, they, they were for the British um, because of the history of Caen. I mean, we had William the Conqueror as the Duke of Normandy and the King of England that created links uh, between our two countries. And uh, for example, in 1943, there were lots of trains traveling across the city of Caen and making a stop at the train station but without really stopping. They were on their way to go to Germany. You know, it was the service du travail obligatoire, the yeah. Uh, mandatory labor that many Frenchmen were forced to go to Germany for working for the German war effort. And many of these trains uh, were covered by inscriptions, uh, which was long life to De Gaulle. And, uh, um, uh, you know, it was for the uh, Allies to be successful. And um, there were groups of Frenchmen who were embarking on board of this train um, in Caen to go to Germany. And within a few minutes, the train was covered by inscriptions. So there were uh, lots of people who were not happy with the German occupation, but it was difficult to um, be free to express themselves yeah. because they were immediately punished and there were lots of punishments. And of course, there were a lot of Germans in Caen because it's there the, the crossroads of town. I mean, when we talk about La Manche and the villages up in the Saint Mary Glees, Saint Mary de Mont area, they saw fewer Germans day to day than the people of Caen did because of the importance. It's the river, the river Orne, the, the rail network, as you said, all the crossroads, all the roads going south to Falaise and to uh, Argentan and off to saint pierre sur -Dive. So, you know, you can't, you can't hide away from the Germans in somewhere like Caen. So you're, you're confronted with the occupation day to day. And we'll talk later on about the, the prisoners in the, and what happened on June the 6th, because my great uncle, We'll get to that later on, encounter some French resistance people who told him about that. So we'll, we'll come to that later on in the show. Um, it's, um, it's always uh, fascinating to talk about um, an aspect of the Battle of Normandy that people I think watching don't know about. I think a lot of the British uh, military groups who come to visit Normandy, they often stay in Caen, but then they spend most of their days out, as you said earlier, at the beaches and the sites that they know about. And, and, and Caen is considered kind of where they go to the restaurants in the evening and have a drink possibly, but don't always think about the actual fighting in the city itself. So it's wonderful to bring some of the stories to light there. So um, during the course of the show, as a mag's going to be moving through, we've got lots of then and now show photos to show you. Gwen is going to share some of his research. Karine's going to add comments about the, the churches and the, the abbeys and the streets we pass through. And hopefully we'll bring all this um, to light for you. So the reason, Mag, I'll bring Matt, I'm going to spotlight you now, Mag. It's, you've been standing there waiting for a while. So Mag, tell us where you are. I'll, I'll unmute you, Mag. Where where are you, Mag? I'm. Hello, you hear me? Yep, we hear you now. Can you hear me? Okay, well, I'm right in the center of Caen, uh, facing the um, uh, Saint-Pierre Church. Uh, in the back, we have what's left of the Tour Le Roi. Um, behind the Tour Le Roi, it's the port, uh, the, the port of, uh, of Caen. So I'm really downtown Caen here, where I'm facing the chateau as well. Uh, and I'm just turning around to show you this is a bit where you find uh, most of the shops around here, the, the, the Centre Ville, as we say in French. Um, and I turn around again, and in the back, we have another church. Saint Jean, so I'm really in fact between Église Saint Pierre and Église Saint Jean, uh, and I'm also facing um, this pharmacy, uh, Pharmacy du Progrès, um, and I'm I'm guessing Paul, uh, you want to talk about your I, uncle? I will uh, in, a, in a few in a few minutes time. In Mag, a few I'm minutes, gonna, okay. So yeah, I, no, want just, I wanted, I wanted okay. to show the viewers just how vibrant and busy Caen is today. And then I want to read you another quotation by my great uncle about what he saw when he moved in that morning, because he comes in uh, from the north, from uh, from the, the Rue de Delivrande, and, and his description of what he saw in Caen. I'll share some photos of, of, the, of the generic photos of the rubble in the city that morning. Um, these aren't always of the Royal Oster. These are various British third division units. But this is what my great uncle said. 
He said, as we did, well, he, to, first of all, I should say his battalion had suffered 85 men killed or wounded just getting into position before the July the 9th, the morning of July the 9th. So just the day before, they've suffered, you know, about 15% uh, killed or wounded just getting into position at the beginning of Operation Trump. But here's what he says about the description of, uh, of arriving into Caen. He said, as we descended towards the town, it was almost impossible to identify roads and tracks. The whole area resembled a vast moonscape with trees, abandoned vehicles, and what had once been houses covered in thick layers of dirt and masonry dust. And these are the kind of streets that he was confronting. I'm sharing these various images now, and I'm telling a particular story. I'm hoping some of my family are watching this. Because as he's leading his platoon down south into Corn with all this rubble and all this horror, he's, they're actually kind of crawling along because they're under mortar fire from the Germans. And he's on one side of the street and the other side of the street, about 15 feet ahead of him, he can see something glistening in the sunlight. There's something glass in the rubble. And he crawls across the street and picks it up. And it was a rather unattractive paperweight, an ornament from a French house that someone had been using on their desk to weigh down papers. And he was just thinking it wasn't a particularly attractive paperweight when mortars landed back on the other side of the street where he had been two seconds earlier. So if he hadn't crawled across the street to pick up the paperweight, he would have been killed. And apparently, well, he took it back home with him in his small pack. And I think my my dad's cousin, Barbara Barr, who may be watching, I think still has that paperweight. I'd love to get a, show, a photo of it one day. Um, so he was saved. His life was saved by by picking up a souvenir. And, you know, he describes coming into this city and just destroying this de this devastation. And I think that's why I wanted to show these photos to just see how how much rubble there was. And, and, and Karin, it was the bombing had been I mean, they'd been bombed on June the 6th, hadn't they? So this this is this is weeks of bombing. But this bombing on the July the 8th had been particularly horrendous, hadn't it? So. Have you got any stories of some civilians who have been caught up in this and what they what they thought about it? Yes, well, something that it's almost impossible to realize for us nowadays is in which mind the people were. Um, most people, the big majority of people, were waiting for the liberation. And no one in Caen thought that the Allies would land in this part of Normandy because they, all, they were all convinced that the Allies needed a deep water port to unload all of the supplies necessary to win the battle. They had no idea that the Allies were going to bring artificial ports and everything. Um, so it was a big surprise when uh, during the night, by two, three o'clock in the morning, they were woken up by this noise of all of the bombing and uh, you know shelling that uh, was coming from the coastline and some people went out, talked with their neighbors on, on June 6th, but uh, very early in the morning, and understood that it was the landings because some people had come um, close enough to the coastline to see the ships and everything. So they, had, they were quite um, excited and at the same time scared about what could happen to them. And they were already thinking maybe we're going to be liberated before... Um, before night. And then by 1.30 in the middle of the day, you know, the uh, lunch in France is very important. So most of them were still having uh, lunch. And then the first air bombings happened and many people died. And another air, air bombing happened later during the day and during the night and again and again and again. And unfortunately, they learned to um, how to live under such conditions to survive uh, was um, more than to live, it was surviving, you know. And many people got, re uh, first of all, many people escaped. My family members escaped. As, uh, right after the first carpet bombings, they escaped. They were part of the people who chose to escape. But it was a very difficult decision to make because mm. some of those who escaped were killed further away in another town. Nobody was here to tell them, go there. It's a safe place to go. There was no safe place to go, or there were, but it was just by luck that you ended in a safe place. So some of the people who escaped, like my family members, went in a good place, and they were lucky they survived. Some others who escaped went in a place where they were not so, so much in safety and were killed by other air bombings or in uh, other circumstances in the middle of a battle. Some people stayed in camp. And some of them died, and some others were lucky to survive. It was only a question of 
of luck, you know. And I think it's interesting to put it in perspective with the soldiers who landed on, our, on the beaches and fought after. Guiding with many of them, you know, I discovered that it was exactly the same. You just talked about your great uncle who survived by luck. And it yeah. was, you know, you were lucky or you were not. Well, the people of Caen were exhausted after so many air bombings, shelling, never knowing when the next one was going to happen, where the next bombs were going to fall. They were some of them who had chosen to get sheltered in um, quarries, you know, stone quarries. Uh, they were 50 feet under um, the level of the ground in uh, rather safe areas, but it's not pleasant to be underground for such a long time, for a whole month. And there were others who got refuged in uh, the abbeys, you know, Abbey Saint Sauveur, Abbey of the Men. But it was difficult because of certain days, the tension was very, very big, like uh, during the um, last big air bombing before the liberation of the northwestern part of Caen. And many times, um, the uh, priest in charge of the um, church of the Abbey of the Men, where so many people were refuged, uh, absolved them. He was coming and he was giving the absolution to everybody because they thought they were going to die this time. So they were exhausted, but they were also shocked. They were um, surprised every day to still be alive. And uh, it was like being a night nightmare. You would like to wake up, but uh, it doesn't happen. Gwenny is just approaching the uh, third division monument and we are going to be focusing on the British third division, but that's not to say that there wasn't the British 59th Staffordshire division. They're not so much pushing the city of Caen. They're dealing with the Germans north and northwest of the city. The Canadian third division are pushing in from the west. It just happens that the unit that was first into the city were units of the 9th Brigade of the uh, third division. So that's particularly the Royal Rifles. And... Um, when my great uncle and the other men from the Royal Oss Rifles pushed their way into where, in fact, where pretty much where Gwen is standing, they came in and they arrived on the area near the Boulevard des Allies, and they were in this area here, kind of just near the near the castle, the centre part of town. And um, at this point, the organisation of the battalion gets very, very confused because although the books say they're moving in a straight line, platoon by platoon, they went off following their way through the rubble to see what there was in the way of Germans. And the Germans were there. Some were kind of clearly wanting to surrender, but others were holding out. And my, uh, the, the conditions were that from the north, the way the British third division were coming, not only could they not even get any tanks in because of the rubble, they were struggling to even get universal carriers in with anti-tank weapons. So they were always fearful of a German counterattack. They knew their reports of Panthers of the 12th SS around them. So they were, they wanted to have a means of defending themselves in case the Germans counterattack, because that's something the British third division have learned in a month of fighting is when you push out and advance, the Germans will counterattack and hit you. And then this position, they don't want to be vulnerable when Germans start, pushing towards them so they're trying to defend but they can't get the vehicles in to defend and and while they're patrolling around so we're going to go to mag now we'll come back to you in a second greg gwen so when we're what mag is now facing the um the pharmacy and my great uncle was leading a patrol of his 15 15 platoon um and as he was they were checking for snipers and there wasn't so much rubble in this area the rubble was was more uh, in other areas but he noticed two cameramen who were filming and they'd managed to have been part of the advance. And I'm gonna share that footage with you now. And I hope it isn't too jerky with the bandwidth. So here's a video. It's only a few seconds long, bear, bear with me. And um, so this is showing the area where Mag is standing. And that there is my great uncle on the right there with his stand gun, his sergeant, uh, and that's my great uncle's head there going past. It was very blink and you miss it. And these are the streets near where, where Mag is standing. Indeed, Gwen will be working. And you can see the the, rubbish, the, the rubble everywhere. And there's a, an Ulsterman, a Royal Ulster Rifles guy, I think, handing a cigarette to a local guy. And that's another area of the destruction of car. You can see the church. And that was the end of that. It was a short, I might I might rewind it a bit and, and, and get back to the beginning again, possibly. Um, no, I can't. It won't let me do that. But that was the area. And here is a photo. Mag, Mag if you show the view of the um, of the pharmacy again, I'll share the photo. Because there was the, one of the guys was a stills photographer. 
so here comes the photo so i've just got to find it again it's a real pain to find it so here we go this is a pre-war photo of that pharmacy you can see it was a very grand building and a timber front a timber framed building the right there and as you can see, and Karine will come back, uh, back me up on this, Con was quite prosperous before the war. It's, you know, there, it's a, it's a kind of a mod for the 1930s was a modern city with the rail links and the tramways. So there's quite a, quite, there's some money. It's quite a lot of middle-class properties around here. But here is the photo of my great uncle Cyril, Cyril Rand, standing on that bit of rubble in front of the ca uh, pharmacy with the Paris Rouen Le Mans Laval sign. And his sergeant there, his sergeant's name is, I've uh, just, uh, Sergeant Robert John Rainey and he's wearing a sweater there and they've both got Sten guns my great uncle always said for urban warfare he he would he carry a Sten gun he'd take a rifle when he was on in the field so he didn't look so much like an officer but in the uh and I should have said he's a platoon commander well I did say that for the urban work he's he's taking a Sten gun look how much dust there is on his boots just alone you can see that the the conditions there he's just filthy dust with um with all the masonry uh damage there and then I'll keep showing these photos. There's several in this uh, I've got here. So, Mag, if you can pan around now to the church again. And remember the other photo we've got? So show the church there on the left and the, the tour in the background. I hold that kind of view there. So there we are. There's Mag's view. And here is the same area. Again, I've got to get my photo ready. Bear with me. It's all, I've got so many photos to juggle with today. It's a, and they, each time I go back to find, they've moved in the folder so pharmacy there we are there is the same view mag is looking at back then and you can see clearly how the, the church has been heavily damaged and there's a morris light reconnaissance car over there in the background and this building here was the old market the howl and that's long since gone but the tour is still there behind there follow my mouse i'll put it back onto mag's view again so if you look there the side of the church and there's mag's view so there's the side of the church and there's the tower there and it's a bit wobbly, the camera footage, because Mag's not using a gimbal tonight because it looks a bit weird walking through the city center with a stabilizer. So she's just using the phone as it is. And then I'll show another couple of photos of, of, the, of the church. And uh, then, then Mag can start walking off to her next site. Um, so fantastic camera work, by the way, guys. So here is the next photo of the... There's another view. Um, I think that's some time left. I think they've cleared up some of the rubble by then, but obviously the church is still in brave, poor condition, but the, the streets look a bit clearer there. So I think that's a few days later. And then another one uh, from of a different angle of the church there. And you can see there's the whole remnants of buildings just um, barely standing there. So um, fantastic. So Mag, I think you can head off towards uh, your second location, which is, is my great uncle's platoon headquarters. I'll bring Gwen's feed back in again because Gwen's got to head off south towards the river shortly because we've already been talking for half an hour. So there's Gwen. Um, where are you, Gwen? I've, I've are you still? Are you heading south now? Okay, I'm just uh, I'm just by the boogie right now. Uh, okay. And uh, so this is uh, one of the old preserved streets still left over, and uh, and we're gonna soon rejoin the uh, Saint Jean streets, Saint Jean area, um, the bombed out area nearby the river. And yeah. then uh, by the river. So and Gwen's got an awful lot of distance to cover tonight. So we'll have to own a round of applause in a bit because he's covering a lot of a lot of the city tonight. Mag's got a short on. So um Paul, okay. yes. If I can add something of course before, you can. before Mag is leaving the area of the church Saint Pierre. Okay. This is a major piece of architecture, really part of the jewels of the architecture of Caen. And the people of Congo were very, very proud of their church. And it was really heartbreaking to see the beautiful spire, uh, you know, the way it was shelled. Uh, we can um, mention that it was shelled by the HMS Rodney, which was a battleship offshore yep, of, yep. Uh, of the coastline. So I think uh, Mag is already on her way there. I'll, sh I'll show the photo again of the church there, just that, that, yes. that one there. I mean, it, it had been... So the it's, fire gone. this oh, part God. of the church dates from the 15th century, second part of the 15th century. It's flamboyant, gothic, and the apse, the other part, which is the back of the church, actually, close to the Pharmacy du Progrès, is Renaissance from the, the end of the 15th century, beginning of the 16th century. And it was really a remarkable architecture that 
uh, was mentioned in many guidebooks of the time before World War II and still now because the reconstruction was really well done. So, um, and it's been then, cleaned, isn't it? Recently, they've they've just they've just cleaned all the facade of it, so it's looking yes. really beautiful, lovely and pale and crisp and cream now. So it was yes. it was quite they dirty a few years ago. They had to do some restoration because, unfortunately, after World War II, they had not used. Oh, um, Mag Mag's there the again. Oh, right. So. You're still there, Mag. Brilliant. So there's there's that there. I mean, you can see there how the stonework has been really, really cleaned up, like cities in um in England, like Bath, are made of the similar kind of stone with all the vehicles and congestion. They get blackened over the years, and then work has been taken. It took a couple of years, I think, to clean the church off, and it's looking yeah. absolutely beautiful. And those who come to Caen, please walk around and look at this amazing city. There's lots of good shopping there and lots of good eating, and perhaps wait till the virus has gone away, but it's a beautiful area. So Mag's heading off to the 15 platoon headquarters that my great uncle <laughs> moved to. And um, when my uncle was in this town and he was in the area near the church and uh, he met members of the French resistance and there's photos of the British uh, troops meeting members of the resistance. And they had been told that they were likely to meet French combatants who were coming out and they were, they were grateful to meet them. And one particular guy told my great uncle about the, what had happened to the prisoners on June the 6th. And he was very upset about that. So for our viewers, what had happened on back, back on the, in the first part of the invasion to the, to the, to the prisoners. Karine. Excuse me. Yes. Yeah, um, what, what happened to the, the, the prisoners on June the 6th in the jail? In, yes. in um, uh, the prisoners who were in the prison um, of Caen uh, were executed probably because the Germans um, had tortured them. And um, all, I mean, uh, they knew that uh, torture was against um, the laws for about treating prisoners of war. And uh, they wanted to finish their dirty job, eliminating proofs uh, before the Allies liberated the city. And they probably thought maybe the Allies are going to liberate Kahn before um, the end of the day. So these, um, Prisoners were taken into small courtyards inside the city, the prison, sorry, and were executed. Uh, we are sure that they were executed because they are witnesses who, um, who told, but um, the bodies have been buried in some secret place and they have never been discovered. Yeah. And you think, you have to think about these prisoners who had fought, they were resistance members, they had taken part to sabotages. And they fought for um, this day of the liberation. You know, they were uh, doing things, and in their presence, they probably survived with the idea to try to still be alive at the time of the liberation. And then they probably heard, uh, they heard, of course they heard, the noise of the shelling and the battleships and the air bombings. They had understood that the Allies were landing and that the liberators were close, but then that the same day they were executed. So something that have always, you know, uh, been in my mind how powerful it must have been. And uh, at least they had lived long enough to hear that the landings had happened. Yeah. And, and I, I always check the comments we've got coming in. And, and one, of the, one of our viewers, Thomas, is saying, of course, because they're, in a sense, political prisoners, they're, 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 they are treat traitors to the to the german occupation they don't they don't have to be a there's no uh, geneva convention for them because under the occupation they're just criminals the germans uh, have can do whatever they want to them because they're not they're not conventional prisoners of war so 86 of them were, were killed and and gwen is carrying on down towards um the the river and he's going to stop at a various location on the way and point out things he's he he knows about um so, but yeah, and Patrick is watching is saying that, yeah, I'm not saying they're criminals, Patrick. I'm saying that from the German point of view, anybody who offers resistance is considered a, a criminal um, yeah. and, and or political dissident or, or treason. And so how the Germans sometimes treat, tre treated um, uh, prisoner of war, prisoners of war is very different to how they would treat um, resistance work fighters. Um, so, um, yeah, and, and Gwen is going past the same pharmacy where Mag was over. Gwen is heading off in a different direction. Um, so uh, that, Matt, that, that we're, that's where, where, where Gwen is going. So um, uh, going back to the Royal Austin Rifles coming into town, another thing I want to talk, bring Karine in here is, is my great uncle witnessed um, a number of French ladies being dragged out of houses and having their heads shaved. This is on July the 9th. This is like the liberation isn't even, you know, the, 
it isn't even over yet. They're still fighting in the town. There are still Germans actively resisting. There are snipers, there are mortars, and already French women are being dragged out of houses and having their heads shaved. And my great uncle wishes that he had better French back then to communicate, because what he wants to tell these people and is, is let he, uh, you know, quoting the Bible, saying, let him who is at, without sin cast the first stone, because his feeling was some of these men grabbing the women and shaving their heads may have been just as guilty of, of um, you know, crimes, quote unquote, in the war. And I personally think it's a tragedy that these women were treated with such such disrespect um and often it's guilt on the half on behalf of the male so what, what's your what's all your feeling as a woman from Caen? what what's your feeling about that the head shaving business well first of all i'm surprised that it happened so early I think. yeah it is surprising isn't it yeah but he specifically says on july the 9th they're already mm -hmm. happening yeah, to be honest with you i never read or heard anything about uh, women being shaved so early but um uh, it, it i mean if he has seen it. Well, he, he uh, left the city by the July the 10th because he was off yeah. the, towards Troan. So he was only in the city for two days. So, so you know, he must have, I mean, I don't know how many, he doesn't say how many, mm -hmm. he just says there were several being dragged out. So um, yeah. I don't know which area of the city he was talking about because he's moving about on patrols, but some are in the, the shopping area, I'm guessing. But yeah, it's, um, he, he was very upset by that. Well, um, you, he, he could be upset because it's something that is quite, I mean, it's a nasty behavior. And most of the people who captured these poor women or girls, um, uh, they were just having a revenge on, on the people. You know, they were not brave enough during the German occupation to fight against German soldiers, but they were brave enough right after they had been liberated to have a revenge on people who could not defend themselves. You see what I mean? Yeah, no, definitely. So, That's exactly how I feel. And... Um... And at some point, I want to do a show about about what is resistance and what is collaboration, because, yes. you know, if you're a farmer and you're asked to provide hay for the Germans, if you don't provide the hay, you get shot. Is that collaboration or is that survival? It's a very complicated, nuanced subject that I think isn't given enough attention by British and American authors, that they want to group everybody in occupied France to resistance and collaborators, when in fact 90 percent of the population are in the middle somewhere trying to live on a day-to-day -day basis and survive and keep their families alive and feed their families and they're judging the the changing situation as they can with the bombing and things and and the, the treatment of the women was particularly harsh i think and um so mag looks like she's come well mag is now in front of what is now a clothes shop zara so she's in rue de strasbourg in in the the the, the very kind of restored downtown area of Caen now and that is the building and I worked this out from my great uncle's memoirs because he particularly remembers that the shop was called Delaunay and that shop I did some research was the Delaunay uh, grocer uh, department store back in the 1940s it's now become Zara and that is where my great uncle set up his platoon headquarters on July the 9th and his men dug in around that building or in the streets making walls out of the rubble to defend themselves against the potential German counterattack. And one of the, th the stories that my great uncle tells is about one of his Lance Corporals who had been out on a patrol and he came back with blood gushing from a wound to his head and in actually typical of kind of head wounds. It wasn't a particularly deep wound, but it was bleeding profusely. And this Lance Corporal had already in the previous days been showing signs of battle fatigue from the battle, the fighting in Combon Plain, and, and he's come back wounded and he was in a very bad way and, and, and shock, shock more than the wound itself. And my great uncle sent this Lance Corporal into the back of the shop, the Lone, as it was then, to, to kind of take some moments to recover in the quietness there. But he actually fell down a, a little elevator shaft. There was an elevator in the shop there and he fell about five feet down the elevator. It wasn't it was only five feet, not 20, 50 feet, but he fell down an elevator shaft. And my great uncle spoke quite at length about this poor guy showing battle fatigue. And in fact, this poor chap was actually evacuated back to England by the medical orderlies and he never saw him again. And I wanted to get that point in there because if you've been in the British Third Division, like Karine was saying about the experience the French have had of the bombing for weeks, months, years, 
some of these British soldiers as the Canadian soldiers have been now a month of combat. They've seen absolute horror. They've seen their men killed. I mean, my great uncle alone in his platoon, which started this day on July the 9th with a strength of 23 men, I think, had already lost eight killed or wounded before they even got to the middle of the city. So he's lost a third of his strength. So everybody's lost a best friend. Everybody's seen someone die slowly. Everyone's been kept awake by shelling. Everyone's seen all this horror. And of course, some soldiers tragically fell victim to just mental fatigue. And this poor Lance Corporal, who my great uncle doesn't name in his memoirs, was just evacuated back. He was, you know, PTSD, shell shock, whatever you want to call it. But that happened in that building there. So that building was where my great uncle was. And again, I'll show you a couple of photos, those watching, of, of the rubble and, and, and the destruction around here. Because it's very hard to imagine how, how awful that area was. At the time, I'm trying to find my photos. There's the one I'm looking for again. Um, that's not exactly where Mag is right now, but it shows you complete buildings have been absolutely leveled there. And it was very easy. You didn't have to dig in. You just made up a pile of stones from the from the from the burned out house. And that's Rue Saint Jean. That's where Gwen is walking right now, or that direction. And the Saint Jean quarter was was as you can see in that photo there, pretty pretty badly badly. Um, so Mag, that's uh, Mag. You've done that, that Zara now. So uh, you can head off now to uh, Rue Saint Pierre, and um, and tell us about that church that Mag is showing there, Karine. That's one of the oldest ones, isn't it? Yes. Well, it's also a Gothic church, and it's uh, Notre Dame de Froid de Rue, and um, it's um, in the in, in the sector of Caen that was more preserved. The street that is on the other side uh, has been less bombarded. Something that is obvious when Mag or Gwen are walking across the city are the wide avenues, large streets. It was not like this before the war. And um, the city has really, really changed. Earlier, you said something about uh, how modern the city was, uh, rich. And it's not exactly true. Uh, they were, um, it was a rich city with a lot of notable people who were, you know, entrepreneurs and everything. But the city was an old city in bad shape. It had never been reorganized like other cities like Paris or, you know, uh, modernized. And uh, for example, um, the, as the city is very low in altitude, uh, there were arms of rivers, the river Orne and the river Odon that was still going across. And there was one arm of the river Odon that was very close to its church. Before World War II, there had been a, a quiz for the French people to vote for the nicest and the nastiest cities. And Caen city had been elected as the nastiest one, the nastiest city of France to live in. Wow. Because of a lot of um, uh, houses didn't have hot and cold water, um, not very good electrical system, and lots of fevers because of the um, arms of rivers that were used as uh, uh, sour and everything, you know. So uh, there had been a plan of reconstruction studied by the city of Caen be between the two wars. And it happened to be too expensive and they had never uh, done this, reconstru this reconstruction program. Um, then World War II happened and Caen was destroyed. And so they looked in uh, um, the desks, you know, at office where they had put the plans of the reconstruction studied before the war and they adapted it. It was not exactly the same plan, but then they were forced to rebuild the city and then it became a modern city. But at the time of the reconstruction, they, uh, they did things well in order to put the monuments that had survived, like the churches we just saw, um, put them in value in the middle of the reconstruction of the modern sections of Caen. And it's a very well done reconstruction. Caen is considered as a, a city that has been re well rebuilt, uh, really a successful reconstruction with the, the stone of Caen, the Caen stone, because Caen is built on stone quarries, in Middle Ages, um, it was built on stone quarries and they were taking the stone on the left to build with it on the right. And so for the reconstruction, they tried to use the Caen stone as much as possible to keep the spirit of Caen, you know, to uh, let it uh, re be uh, rebuilt, uh, to look like as much as possible, like it was not exactly the same, but at least with the Caen stone. 
Yeah, well, Gwen has moved to another location that's important to, to, to uh, the Royal Ulster Rifles history. It's now a Havas Voyage, but that back in the, uh, the 1940s, indeed, up until a couple, 20 years ago, was Thomas Cook, uh, the uh, travel agent on the ground floor. And then up the stairs was uh, West de Clare, the offices of a French newspaper that had uh, branches in Le Havre and Rouen and, and Caen. And it's all though that, that corner has been completely uh, rebuilt. If you back up a little bit, Gwen, so we can, so you can see the tree there. That tree um, is, our, is our indicator that this is where this photo was taken at the time. So I'm showing other photos. Now, I'm apologize, this isn't a terribly good quality one, this one. But this is a photo of, I believe, my great uncle's fellow platoon commander. He was in C Company, Roy Purcell. And I believe that's the building where Roy Purcell had his platoon headquarters and there's also on the left there you can see a member of the french resistance with a, a tricolor there and there's a british union flag there and they again they're clearing rubble and that's they are men of the royal Oster rifles there and that is the thomas cook building as it was then that is now uh where gwen is you can see the tree there there's a tree that's still there that identifies it as being that location i'll put the photo up again one more time so you can just confirm there is the pretty much the same you can see the, the tree in the top corner there and um and there is a tree in the top corner there and that interesting is a slightly a slightly rude story now because when my great uncle went to visit visit roy purcell in i think that building there was a subway entry fairly near that corner there the com had a had a big busy sub when has um surface trams but at the time it had subways and the members of roy purcell's platoon were going down two or three into the subway and I'll, I'll read my great uncle's quote. He said, Roy Purcell became aware that members of his platoon were going down into the subway in twos and threes, only to be replaced by others on their return. Wondering why they were so interested in this particular spot, he decided to investigate and went down to find a young lady who was doing her best to reward the gallant liberators uh, of her town in a manner she hoped would be most pleasing to them. When she eventually left that evening, she was seen carrying a string bag filled to overflowing with cigarettes and chocolate. So a young lady from Caen was uh, showing the grat her gratitude to her liberators in exchange for some chocolate. It's a slightly rude story there, but I just, it's one of my great uncle's memories and I thought I'd share it there. And that um, is, is what um, happened in that area there. And, there, and Gwen is now moving off. This is another, another which, which church is that, Karine? Because I lose my track. Is it 13 churches in Caen, 15? It's a lot, isn't it? Sorry? Is it 13 oh, yes, churches? There are lots of them, yes, lots of them. Uh, it depends uh, if you count the, only the churches or the towers of the churches. But it's Oh, yeah, and the abbeys as well, of course. But they're that, anyway. Um, Mag so it is the church, church Saint-Jean, Saint-Jean. Yeah. And that's the one that leans. It's, it's kind of the leaning tower of Pisa of Caen oh. because it's all, it's on the, it's, well, can, can you see that viewers that it's, um, it's all just leaning to the left. The bottom bit, the left hand and right bit are kind of level, but the main central tower is all leaning over to the left. Yes. And so it, not it, quite it, as dramatically as in Pisa, but yeah, beautiful. During the construction, because this section of Caen is on a very marshy area. And uh, during the construction, when they started building this, the pile of the lift that we could see leaning started leaning. And they corrected, um, you know, by balancing the, the stones better. Uh, they kept building in order so, uh, to let the facade be standing up. And they did a good job because it's still standing up after so many yep. centuries. And I'm coming to Mag now because Mag is in Rue Saint-Pierre. And there's a couple of period photos taken in this area to give, again, to give the viewers an idea of how much destruction it was. So there you can see, if you kind of hold it steady, Mag, you've got the side of the church on the left there. Then there's the other church tower down there. And I'll, I'll, I'll show the two photos I've got ready. So where are we? This is, I'm shuffling through all my photos. So Rue Saint-Pierre, where are we? Uh, there's that one. So there um, is the same area. And I've got another photo. No, that's back the way I came. But there we go. There's the same on the left there. You can see the same bit of the, the, the church down there. And there, oop, not that one. That one there. So Mag is in that exact area. And the same buildings, the railings and the uh, the shutters and things. And there's that corner, that arch there with the church there. And you can see all these buildings have completely come down. And I'll put back Mag's view there. And there is the view today, 76 years on from when that photo was taken. So 
although there's been lots of reconstruction, you see that some of the same shutters and things to left and right are still there. There's obviously modern apartment buildings there as well now, but that's Rue Saint Pierre, and um, I'll get, I'll show that one of the rubble again there, just to give an idea. I, the reason I'm so slow bringing my photos up is each time I go back to the folder, they've moved inside the folder, so I have to find them again by searching through. I've got over 50 photos to to shuffle through today, so bear with me. I'm still trying to find it. It's gone again. Where are we? There's the Rue Saint Pierre. So there's that same view there. And um, there's another one I'm going to try and get you again. Oh, the, the one with the, the the very famous one with the British soldiers coming down is where the hell has it gone? I can't find the damn thing now. Uh, it's always the case where I try and is it gone? Where the hell has it gone? I cannot find it. Maybe I closed it down. I can't find it. Anyway, um, so Gwen is now. Where are you, where are you, Gwen? You're still. You're heading off towards the, the Yorn, yes. Um, I'm heading uh, by the river. It's uh, it's on the next block. So we're leaving out the Saint Jean area, and uh, I don't know if you notice, but beside the church that we stopped by a little earlier on, there is not a single old building. No. In my eyesight. <laughs> The church St. John is the only old construction in what was named before the war, the island St. John, because it was um, encircled by river arms, by the Odon, and it was very, very marshy. And um, something uh, that they did at the reconstruction, because there had been a lot of floods, people uh, were you know, forced to leave their houses flooded and everything before the war. So... As almost all of the buildings in this section had been destroyed, for the reconstruction, they spread out um, ruins, you know, stones of buildings destroyed um, on the bottom of the section named Island Saint-Jean. And they increased the level of the ground in this section of Caen of two meters. So this section of Caen has been rebuilt on two meters um, deep um, stones from the ruined buildings, from the buildings that collapsed during the Battle of Caen. And they this also. Is, this is why we had you on the show, Karine, because I didn't know that. So that's, this is exactly the kind of little trivia, little bits of detail that we didn't know. So um, fantastic stuff. Just to, for those watching, Mag is heading off now to her next location, which is um, the. Uh, the, um, uh, where should she go? Palais de Justice, uh, the Ancien Palais de Justice for another then and now photo. Gwen is heading off towards the the uh, the river to show us some of the details there. So um, uh, Mag will come back online again, which is in the next location. So where, with the regards to the liberation on July the 9th, and we'll get to the Abbey aux later on and talk about the, 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 the actual liberation service, but um, what do you think was when the when the uh, the, the the people of Caen, that those who were still in the city, saw the British arriving from the north and the Canadians arriving from the west? Was it was it relief? Was it gratitude? Was it a, mi a mixture of everything when they saw those? I mean, and, and they're standing in the rubble of their own houses. It must have been very mixed feelings that day. It was very mixed feelings. Yes, because they had lived during such a long time. Um, you know, at the beginning, they thought it was the liberation. And uh, the people who stayed um, in the first days, first weeks, but it lasted so long, you know. So at the beginning, they believed we're going to be liberated tomorrow. We're going to be liberated tomorrow. And every day they were thinking this. But after a while, they were not so much believing in anything anymore. They were just, you know, every day trying to find food. Because when you get sheltered from bombs, at some point you have to get out to find food and find water. Water is a big problem. You can live without eating during a long time. You cannot live without drinking very long. And the water was polluted. It was a quest every day to go and try to get some water. So when they met the first British and Canadian soldiers, there was happiness, reliefment, but they had a hard time believing it was true. Were they really liberated? Um, was it really the end? Um, so some people were very happy, tried to look for flowers or wine, what they could find to offer to their liberators. Some other people were, you know, they were not so sure of, um, was it something um, that they should do if ever the Germans were coming back? Was it prudent? 
Um, and some people, most people, I guess, were just exhausted. You know, something that people don't realize in such a situation is that they never had the time, the people of Caen or other cities who were under these air bombings and shelling during such a long time, they never had the time to cry they're dead. Yeah. And it was at the liberation, when they were finally liberated, that they could do. So it was, you know, of course, reliefment, but also all of the sadness, all of what they could not afford themselves, uh, that was coming, you know, out of themselves. And they felt like crying. They were thinking for the first time about how many people uh, they had lost and uh, what they had gone through. And so very mixed feeling, yes. So we're, we're going a bit out of sequence, those watching, because we're going to talk about the bridges that were built through Caen, uh, uh, Bailey bridges and pontoon bridges in the weeks that follow, because if you come to Normandy today and you're trying to get from the north somewhere like Wistram or the other side of the Orne, uh, Carbourg, or, and you want to go south, you, you hit the periphery, the ring road around Caen, which was built however many years ago. But back at the time, of course, all the traffic went through the city. And um, and there's a lot of traffic heading south because later on you've got uh, Operation Total Eyes and Tractable and all that. And Goodwood is all happening on. So so where Gwen is? There's Gwen. There, he's on the. Um, which bridge are you on now, Gwen? You're the. Uh, which bridge are you on? I'm just on the end uh, of the Saint Jean Islands, or what used yeah. to be the Saint Jean Islands, and at the entrance of what we call the Vossel area. Yeah. Uh, so that was the main bridge in and out. Uh, to get your bearings straight to what's going to matter later on during the battle. This is what we call afterwards the Rue de Falaise. So it's yeah. heading southwards. Uh, over here on my very left, it's going toward Wistram and the shore. So that's where the, for example, the naval round will come down. And, uh, and those bridges were the reason why everything we look around us was devastated for a good reason. And uh, interestingly, this is the first and the last natural border you got in the area. And the la next one you've got is the Seine. There is nothing in between. Now, I'm just going to show some aerial photos so you can see what the area looked like at the time. I'm just going to try and find the right one. Uh, this is this is the bank of the uh, the river on the Key Omla, which is a little bit further up from where Gwen is. So, yeah, I'm, I'm going to put myself pretty much where this picture was taken. Oh. Okay. Um, that's one of the photos that we're going to show just to, to see how much destruction there was. Uh, I'm going to get to another. That's another one. That's a great one, that one there. So you can see just how much leveling there has happened down there. Um, and of, obviously, the British are then contributing to the destruction because we're having, and the French are having to level the rema some of the remaining houses to make space. You can't, some of them were too damaged to be rebuilt. So they had to level and bulldoze everything out. And then, of course, the bridges. So we can start heading off south to continue the battle because the battle isn't over. And even by the end of July the 9th, 76 years ago, the south of Caen was still very, kind of pretty much held by the Germans. We haven't liberated the city, we haven't liberated the, the central part of it. And so these bridges come into the story are very, very important. So Gwen is going to be moving down the riverbank over the next uh, few minutes and he's covering a lot of miles. I'm going to check where Mag is. This is the, um, the difficulty of hosting all this is, ah, oh, yeah, Matt, you're, are you? Oh, you're well, you're nearly there. Ah, oh, well, Mag, Mag is now, you're at the Palais de Justice now. There we are. So if you just go to the left a bit, Mag, where we, I'm going to match up another photo for you then. This is the, um, uh, a, a, another part of town that has a very wide, you can see there, sort of um, class in the middle there. And Karine can tell us more about that location. But I'm just going to, if you hold that shot there. So for those watching, there's the old, the Ancien Palais de Justice. There's a modern building now that actually serves as the administrative uh, equivalent of that. But the building, I think it's because it, it's, been, it's, it's currently empty, isn't it? Karine, I forget now. Is it, is, are they doing something? They're going to be restoring it or something, aren't they? Well, not destroyed because it's an historical monument. <laughs> They're going to do something with it. They're going to restore it as a... I think they still it's... use uh, rooms inside. The, um, it's, it's still having some justice being done. Yep. But it, they transferred almost everything into new ones. They date from the 17th century. It's actually Place Fontet. Uh, so there's, there's the same photo. So there's there's a photo taken probably on July the 9th, maybe a day or two later. There's a British vehicle there. So it becomes some kind of loud speaker um, for the, uh, informing the population. It's got speakers on the top there. And there's that same bit of the columns there. You can see the, the beginning of the word palais there. And there's a, 
there's a cafe over on this side now. I had lunch in there with a friend of Mags with Hervé last year. So that's that same area. And I, I was surprised when Mag and I and Gwen and we put this show together, just how many of these photos are actually about to, 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 to match up. And uh, Roman is watching. He says he's heard it's going to be a luxury hotel, that building. So there's another... That's there's and there's the same view there. So there's that that's that same area. And Mag is carrying on to her next stop, which is gonna be the Abbe Ozom. Uh, while Pierre, uh, Gwen, so I think I said Pierre, Gwen is traveling down the bank of the river and gonna show us more bridges and things like that. So that's the uh, area he's heading off to. And I'll show and, and Gwen, when you when you're ready in position, we can talk more about the bridges and and um, Gwen and his wife Morgan, and they're both from Brittany. They they live in this area and uh, now and they this is where Gwen walks and goes out for his in confinement exercise. And, um, and if, so, if I can add something. Yes, of course you can. As Gwen said uh, just a little bit earlier, uh, you can see that Mag and Gwen are almost on uh, the two extremities uh, of the old city. And where Mag is, uh, she is much further away from the bridges than from the train station. So we can still see a lot of old buildings because this part of the city was not as heavily bombed out as where Gwen is, where almost yeah. everything was destroyed. So I brought that map up again, just you know, the 19th, just to kind of show roughly where. So here are the, the, the bridges across the quay are down here. So Gwen is in this area over here, and then Mag is over coming up to this area here near the Abbey Ozom, and Gwen has been coming kind of south, Mag's going west. I'll show you the other one of the you see, on, on the map you just saw, the Abbey Ozom is the Lycée Malherbe. Yeah, yeah. So it's not in the red area. Yeah, it's just outside. It over, over just missed it, didn't it? Not luckily. far, but yes, you see you know, the over here. Yes. Yeah, and I'll show that the Google image again, just to remind people where Mag is and where and where Gwen has been going. So Mag has now been moving. She started over the pharmacy, the program over here, then went to Zara, the shop where Fifteen Platoons headquarters were. Then uh, down Rue Saint Pierre. Then she's now Palais de Justice over here, and then she's going over the Abbey over here, and finally uh, the Rue de Bayeux, where she'll be finishing her little part of the show and Gwen is working he's on here are the bridges here so he's working his way along around here and will eventually end up over here cross the river over here and kind of take us to the Vosel area there in the church where he'll eventually finish and, uh, so lots of so um Gwen this is where this is your back street this is where you walk isn't it yeah this is where you've worked out some of these um just by walk uh, going out on your walks yeah, it is. Uh, I'm afraid there's a lot of wind at the moment where I am. Uh, so I'm not sure if you uh, hear me right, but we're now basically by the river. So when the, the whole phase of the Goodwood operation is over, then this is the end line for the British and the Canadians. And from there, it's going to take another 10 days or more to just cross that river and to overwhelm the Germans. So as you can see, I don't know if you, I'm just in meditation now, but I'm going to try to see. It, it's quite wide. And uh, it is a shallow one, but you can't you just cross it. So the idea was to, uh, to create a series of platoons and bridges, um, which will take place first on the original locations of the former bridges. But then when we are, it's an area called La Prairie, which is a sort of a wilder extension, unbuilt, sometimes flooded in the winter. And uh, I'm going to try to pinpoint some of the area where you did add some bridges. Found some good photos of the bridges. So I'll show up some photos yeah. because as Wes Duncan was saying yesterday on the, uh, on the first part of the show, um, to advance for the British Army or 21st Army Group to advance um, required ridiculous amounts of supplies. And we never got more than 13 days of supplies. And we often, we would like to have 17 days. If it's something as massive as Operation Goodwood, which takes place later in July, you've got to get an extreme amount of, of supplies and fuel and ammunition to, to the front. And so these bridges in, in, in the middle of Caen were absolutely vital uh, to, to transport all that stuff across. And of course, for later on in August, when you get the push down south towards Falaise and the closing of the Falaise Gap. And I'll show some photos again of the bridges of the Orn area and um... something interesting to um, to add is uh, because some people might wonder why they did not turn around the city of Caen. If you go further south of Caen to go across the river Orn is quite a big problem because there is like a cliff 
you know, to go through. So they were kind of forced to go through Caen. It was really, as you mentioned earlier, the not the only way, but almost the only way to get to the other side. Yeah. And um it's just it's fascinating this this to see how again the the the, the complete rebuilding of this area here how and so are you now where the the the, the if you got to the engineer but you're not quite there are you, are you no you're there aren't you pierre uh, go in. I don't know uh, no here. i'm in the i'm in the first one which was uh, a boat pontoon uh, yeah. uh a lighter one um that you did share pictures with me today and so that's the end point on the other side you can just see uh the little row streets which is there and i'm gonna make my way swiftly so give me another minute and i'll yep, be I'll there just get, i'll just share the photos of the pontoon bridge so everyone can see um, just bear with me, everybody. I'm, I'm, I'm doing this as fast as I can. So we have several photos I found today. They aren't the best quality in the world, but they will suffice. I've just got to find they all moved inside the folder again. Where the hell have they gone? Uh, so th this is exactly where Gwen is. This is uh, the Canadian troops crossing over um, uh, the awn at that point then it's a, a pontoon bridge made with the the, the 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 metal supports that go across it there and that's exactly the, the, the river bank that Gwen was um, was at and there's another angle of it there's a jeep going across and these are pretty neat photos these are and these buildings around here haven't changed too much uh, Gwen can show us that area in a few minutes again oh that's that, that I didn't mention that show that's the rubble again um, but that's the pontoon bridge, and Gwen showed there's some uh, mounting points for one of the bridges that he discovered. I don't think he was the first to discover them, but certainly amongst our circle of friends, he was the first to discover them. So exciting sort of um, relics of the war there. Um, but that's quite a walk. We did that yesterday with, with, with Gwen, and it's quite a walk he's doing up there. So uh, we're, we're, we're all right. We're an hour and 10 minutes in. We've got plenty of time, so it's all, it's all good. Um, Mag, I'm not sure is, is, is at her next position yet, but that um so the, what, what with the bridges um you, you know, you're very uh, clever to say about Karine about the fact the further south the Orn is much steeper size whereas indeed you get with the odon and indeed the Dive, when you get south all the rivers get narrower but they just get so steep sides and vegetation and uh, building bridges over that area is just not easy and the volume of traffic that had to come south it corn was the better the better option um so um yeah it's good stuff i don't know mag seems to have um I don't know where Mag is right now. Uh, she's not 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 online. Uh, yeah, I don't know where Mag is. Well, hopefully Mag will come back in soon. But um, yeah. So Karine, tell us more about um some history about uh what was happening in July. So when did the the reconstruction couldn't happen immediately? So what 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 procedures occurred in Caen to try and get people? Did they move back from the quarries to the city quickly? Was there areas set up like you get the, these days after like a disaster were there were there community community centers how did it work for the people of the city well it's uh, interesting that many people chose to stay in Caen during uh, the combat between d-day and the liberation of Caen although most of them had left you know there was a big evacuation but um, after the liberation uh, the allies kind of chased them away because of there was nothing modern anymore. You know, it was not healthy for people to live. So they were not so happy, but they were forced to, to go somewhere else, which was probably better for them. But people didn't want to leave. These people who had chosen to stay, um, who didn't evacuate, uh, were not happy to leave their houses because it was the, the only things that um, they still had, you know, their house and what was inside. And so uh, it took quite a long time for the reconstruction to start. People tried to come back as early as possible, but it was not so easy. And then the municipality of Caen started building. First, they had to um, restore the electrical factory that had been completely destroyed, and also the sour system. And um, just to set up the electricity again, it took a whole year. To, uh, they needed many people to come and work to um, evacuate the ruins, piles of stones from collapsed buildings. It was a nasty uh, job because of under uh, the stones, they could find human debris, remains, you know. And it took two years 
two years to uh, evacuate the ruins before they could start planning the reconstruction. Wow. So it took until 1963, from 1947 until 1963 for the reconstruction of Caen. But it was much faster than what they thought it would take because uh, after the destruction of Caen, they were really hopeless and thought that it was never going to be rebuilt. Well, so Gwen is now in sight with one of the concrete blocks, or two of them, in fact, that were built by Canadian engineers. So as you can see there, it says there, uh, Royal Canadian Engineers 386 uh, commenced 19th of August, completed 27th of August. And uh, Morgan found that. Is that right, Gwen? It is correct. It is correct. It's my second half who uh, did the discovery. And, uh, and the, the interesting thing I found about it, what she did, is that probably, uh, the people who laid out the bridge uh, did a little thing as well behind us. And so we still have the signing of some of them. Yeah, so for those watching, this is Canadian engineers who have scratched their service number on their name in the, in the concrete foundation. Don't drop your camera, Gwen, though. It's a cool bit of history, though. It's just that reminder in a bit of a thriving city that you still got these, these relics of, of, of the war. And... Um, Really cool stuff, and I'll, I'll, I'll show those photos again of the ore and the, the pontoon bridge and uh, the other bridges that were built, built across because they they had the traditional there was a Winston Bridge and a Monty Bridge, and this this is Churchill Bridge. This is where the Bailey Bridge is built across the Orne there. I don't know what date that was taken. There's dispatch riders and military policemen around there at that point. Uh, this one is a, a Bailey Bridge being con being built, and you can again you can see behind it's you know clearly very very difficult working conditions and as Karine is saying you know of course, it has to be done around the French the French are there trying to trying to get on and, and, and go back there how is all this construction work going on and uh, real real tough time so um, Gwen is now crossing over the Orne and uh, this is a little pretty little area here isn't it where, where is the Lido the swimming pool in relation to where you are Gwen because you, you you had some stories about that so it's further down the river. Uh, right. it's, uh, it was a cabaret at the time, but alongside the river horn here, before the uh, arrival of a municipal swimming pool, you could find some sort of, uh, I would say, lighter reconstructions and several swimming pools, notably. But further down the river, there was one uh, which was attached to the cabaret, uh, the Lido. I've just, I've just shared a photo of the Lido dancing club, and now I'm going to show a photo. No, that's not the one. There's another photo of this area that's still, still there. We were there. We were there yesterday. We're still doing kayaking things there, so it's still used for kind of recreation. I'm just trying to find the damn photo. It just appeared again. Where the hell has it gone? I can't find the stupid photo. There we go. So this is the area just up from where Gwen is standing. Uh, back in the 19, I don't know when that was taken. That photo, but there's the little the little area for swimming, and then you got boats. Yeah. So um, the interesting thing is, uh, I came across a story. Uh, I like to go to the swimming pool, which is just on the other side, and it's named Eugene Mess. And that uh, and Eugene Mess or Eugene Mess appeared to be a football player from uh, Paris. And uh, 1930, they were pretty much a hot shot, uh, but uh, the war coming, he ended up dragged into the First World War and got shot in the knee. So, which limited his ability to perform afterwards, which uh, I would say I'm not a Caen supporter, so which enabled him to rejoin Caen FC. And uh, eventually, uh, he made himself a name around the area, but not about football. The guy was a pretty audacious diver, and he would make some nice ones. And he was also uh, giving uh, swimming lessons to the kids. Eventually, uh, he ended up marrying uh, the daughter of the owner of the cabaret. But uh, the war coming over, um, the chateau in front of the river, the chateau in front of the cabaret is being occupied by the Germans. And uh, I would say that he did not share much love with them because of uh, his patient going down the drain because of them. So uh, he would keep quiet, but eventually, at some point, he did recognize some of the um, uh, local figures, female figures, and, uh, and opened his mouth and said, you know, I have no choice about letting the Germans in, but I, I, I want to refuse you over here. 
and his uh, stubborn attitude is, will uh, will lead him to get arrested and uh, and deported. So it's just um, one individual guy uh, among several. It, it was it was Marie Clotilde Combien, who was the girlfriend of Harold Hines, um, who was named, uh, you know, his code name was Bernard. He was part of the Gestapo. I'm gonna mute your mic for a bit, Gwen. Hang on. Then, so, so Mag, where, Mag is still. So Mag is now um, uh, moved downtown a bit. So where are you, Mag? I'm just in front of the Abbey Ozum. And uh, what? T tell us what happened there. I mean, I'll let you do a bit of talking, Mag, because you've been very quiet and patient. So what? What happened there 76 years ago today? Well, uh, I'm gonna get closer to the to the memorials and to the flowers, but exactly. 76 years ago today uh, at 6.30 p.m., uh, they had a, a ceremony to celebrate uh, the liberation of Caen. Uh, and for the first time in four years, they sang the Marseillaise. Uh, so a pretty moving moment uh, happened there. And I know you have pictures, so um, you'll be able to show the pictures. I'm going to get closer. Yeah. Uh, while you're walking across, I'll show the photos. And as uh, Karin said, uh, the Abbey aux Hommes or the school nearby, the Lycée Malherbe or uh, the uh, hospital as well, that was where um, civilians uh, were able to um, get refugees uh, inside the, the church, a uh, few thousands of them. Um, we call that the Ilo Sanitaire in French, like a, like a sanctuary, I guess. Uh, and um, this is where um, exactly what you're showing, you know, people will be inside the, the church and that, will, that was the only uh, shelter they had. To, to well, make it clear, because there might be people who don't know Caen at all and the story of Caen, but the Abbey of Men was built, um, it was a decision of William the Conqueror and to be his final resting place. So the church that we see the facade on this archive picture on the left, the facade is original from the time of William the Conqueror, from the 11th century. It was one of the biggest churches of the time in the 11th century, because William the Conqueror was one of the most powerful kings of this time. And he's still buried in the choir of, of this church. So the, on the side of the church, there's the buildings of the abbey where the monks used to live until the French Revolution. A big, huge Benedictine abbey. After the French Revolution, it was no more an abbey, no more monks. The church stayed the church, but not the buildings of the abbey. And then by the time of World War II, it was a lycée um, uh, where many students studied. So it had a big kitchen and large rooms and uh, space enough to welcome refugees. And it's the way it became the Ilo Sanitaire, uh, like a, a huge, um, you know, uh, hospital and emergency center to help people. And thousands of people got refuged in the Abbey of the Men for the good reason that it's the church where William the Conqueror, who was the King of England, is buried. And they naively thought that for this reason, the British were not going to drop bombs on the church where their king was buried. Um, Honestly, I know and you know that it was not going to be a problem for the British bomber planes. The only reason why it was not bombed out at first, at the very beginning, was because it was uh, further away from the bridges and the train station. Yeah, yeah, just and then the very quickly after the first people got refuged inside, there, was, uh, there were large red crosses, huge red crosses that were put in place in gardens all around to tell the pilots of the bomber planes that it was like a hospital, and uh, and then they understood, and almost no bombs, almost no shells, but a few <laughs> fell on uh, on the Abbey. And we're being reminded by one of our viewers, Sheldrake Six, who joins most of our shows, who's in Canada. This is where the elements of the Canadian 9th Brigade, the Stormont, Dundas and Gungary Highlanders and the Sherbet Fusiliers met the French of So they've got, they've come in from the West. I'll show you on a map uh, where we are shortly. And um, and going back to my great uncle's story, on his on his walk through the city 76 years ago today, he was well aware um, as an educated Londoner that this is the burial place of William the Conqueror. So went there just to have a look at his tomb and walked in the, the abbey to find these civilians sheltering and was you know shocked by that. Yeah, that was the last thing he thought he was going to see was these 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 civilians there. 
Um, but he still managed to sort of walk through them and he handed over some chocolate and some cigarettes that he, you know, he had um, and, and was still able to send. Here's a photo I took inside the Abbey yesterday because Mag cannot go inside today because it closes at, uh, closed an hour ago. But to give an idea what it was like uh, then for, for my uncle to walk through there. And uh, there is William's uh, um, tomb there. And my great uncle came in to see that 76 years ago today. And so Mag's walk uh, is basically following as best we can my great uncle's route through the city. Of course, he's leading patrols. There's rubble everywhere. He's making some, you know, dead ends and cul-de-sacs. And it's not just walking down a street with a camera, but we're, we're, as best we can, we're showing where he went that day. And Mag is now showing us the, mo the monument there. Can um, We can't read that. Can you read that for us, Mag? Or some of it? Your microphone's off at the moment, Mag. Uh, it's to remember the sacrifice uh, on this day, July the 9th, 1944, um, of um, the ones who liberated Caen, uh, the British, the Canadians, and the French from the resistance. Great. So, and we just had uh, they just had a ceremony this morning, so. You have a pretty fresh uh, uh, reef here, um, so go ahead. No, so I think we we can um, we can have you head off to your last location now because we're an hour and a half in now. Gwen is, I'm gonna go to Gwen now while you're moving. So we'll we'll come back to you later, Mag, when you're at um, uh, Plus uh, Le Boucherie. So Gwen is now on the other side of us. So this is where I walked this area with Gwen yesterday in our reconnaissance. And there's various, show us some of the bullet holes around there, Gwen, that you found. Oh, uh, so we did, we actually did pass some of the houses. Sorry, I, I wasn't uh, looking at you then, sorry. Uh, no, no, but we are, I'm going to see, I'm going to have a quick look if we see a little more. I'm getting there just by the train station, right. which is uh, one of the important bearing. And I'm going to cross it over to rejoin one of the oldest church standing still. Did I see uh, another guy? Is it, did I see um, one of the overlord guides with you? No? Yeah. yeah. Former one. <laughs> Who's that there? I saw, I thought, who is that there then? It's, it's Matthew. Uh, Hello, Matthew. Got a yeah. I, thought, I, I thought I saw you earlier on. I thought that looks like the guide there, but yeah. <laughs> and uh, and there it is. So we're just getting by the by the train station now and a little deeper into the Vosena area. And um, so some of the reading I made about uh, the Germans, this is where they digged in uh, when they had to pull out of the river. It's pretty much in this kind of area, uh, which is a little different from the center, but it used to be one of the main extraction quarry, open air quarry, in contrary to what you can find sometime in the center of Caen, which is underground. But here, the whole area was shaped uh, in this way. So I'm sorry, I'm gonna have to do the, the steps. Uh, while, while you're going, I'll just I'll come back to you in a minute, Gwen. I'll just because yeah. Mag is now in position at her next. Well, have I made, maybe Mag's. So Mag, you're you're facing out of the city. There has the Rue de Bayeux there. That's right. Yes. Yes. Um, Place des Petites Boucheries. Exactly. So I'll just I'll just show the Google Earth. Well, I'll show the the the, the Google Earth image again of, to show the viewers where Mag has found uh, got herself to. So so she's now on the um. No, that's not the one. I didn't mean to do that one. Damn. Hang on. Bear with me. It's getting confusing now. Uh, where's Google One gone? I can't find the image I'm looking for. Where? On. I can't find it now. Um, I'll use the map then. So, Mag is over here on the uh, Rue de Bayer coming in um, from the west there. So, um, that view there, if you hold that shot there, there's a couple of amazing photos that were taken on July the 9th, 76 years ago. So you can see the building there on the left and the road going off the trees. Well, here, stand by for some pretty cool photos here. I'm just going to find the photos. Where are we? So there we are. There's that same view. There's that same. And these are two Sherman tanks, the first Hussars coming around the corner 76 years ago today. And then there's, whoops, that's not for yet. There's another one. Bear with me. I'm still going to find the right one. It is, has it gone 
I wish they wouldn't move in the folder. It's so annoying trying to find the photos. Honestly, I'm, I'm trying to be professional here. And every time I close the, the, the share function, they have moved in the, um, in the folder. It's so annoying. I can't find it now. Where's the other one? Uh, I cannot find it. So, sorry for the pregnant pause here. I'm still trying to find this damn photo. Well, there's the one. I'll put that. Put, I'll put it back on that first. And there's another one I'm going to get to. Just I'll I'll open up another folder and get it for you. Hang on. I will bear with me. This is, I'm doing my best here to get this. Right. So you've seen that one of the two tanks. There's also the other one. I'm sure better find it. I've just reopened up the photo. There we are. There's the other one of a slightly different angle of another first Uzars tank. And there's a Citroen car on the left there. And then Mag's going to go across the street um, and show us the uh, photos taken the previous day, July the 8th. So you head up the street a few a few yards, Mag. And Gwen, where are you? Gwen is now at... We'll come to you in a second, uh, Mag. So you're at yeah. church now. So you're... Um, so I'm just at the Bristol church, but the uh, I would say the atmosphere has changed. Um, there is a very good bar for the one who come to visit Gong. Uh, just in front of me, El Camino. Um, so it's a little bit more of a peaceful atmosphere. But to get your bearings straight, uh, in my feed, I would say if I point out straight, they will see the tip of the church, Saint Jean, and yeah. the, the main city would be down this way. Up. So I can show you there is still here a couple of remains on the side of the, the church. I don't know if this is going to come up well. Yeah, we can see that it's it's absolutely peppered with shell damage and shrapnel. So some of that's going to be from bombing, isn't it? Most of it from aerial yeah. bombing, and some possibly from ground combat. But mostly that height is going to be from shell shrapnel, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, and and again, uh, you have here style contrast. We we just left a little island which was quite preserved with old buildings, and as much as is this part as well. And then if you look this way, uh, which is to get your bearing around down or the train station. Uh, so an important area. The train station will be here, a few hundred yards away from my point, and then the river again, uh, just this way. And this is all gone as well. Yeah. The area. Well, I'm, I'll switch to Mag again, and we'll bring some carry in again. So Mag, Mag is now. Um, I'm trying to see what your view is there. That's that's now that see that building there, the Le Londres, the bar brasserie. I'm going to show you some photos taken there the, the previous day. So these are uh, photos of German Panther tanks of the 12th SS. I'll get the photos ready for you. And these were all taken. So that building there, you can see there, which is an auto repair garage, is now the brassy. And this is a command tank, a Panther a Model A. And this is one of this full information from Sean Claxton, who those who watch these shows before Sean is a knowledge of all things German. And he believes these are two of a group of 10 Panther tanks that were hastily moving towards the Abbey Garden on the 8th of July to try and reinforce the area there that was under attack from the, the Canadians. And so that Panther there is sitting right in front of the, 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 the building that's now a cafe. And then there's that next photo. That's that's another second. That's the same Panther. And that this is these are French civilians dealing with the bombing. Remember the, the, the Halifax bombing. And then there's another photo of a, of a, a Panther model A. Um, the first one was a G. That's the command tank there, and that's the same street there. You can see the same civilians there dealing with the rebels. So that's exactly where Mag is. That is all happening. And that road, road she's looking up towards Bayer is the road that the Canadians, the Regina Rifles, units like that came down this way. And, um, and that photo was taken the previous day as they headed off. All of those tanks, and of course, most of them got knocked out over the next uh, day or two in the fighting. But uh, we had a very nice uh, 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 lunch of uh, uh, Parmentier de Canal there yesterday when we did our reconnaissance. It was very nice. And then back the other way, Mag, you'll show us the photos back. You can see the twin spires of the church there, and I'll show you a couple more photos taken there. Um, and then you'll see again the uh, the then and now shot. I've just got to try and find there we are. There's the one. So that's quite a famous shot, that one. And Mag is in there. So Mag is standing roughly where those two, two civilians are, are standing, and you can see the Allies already using bulldozers to clear the rubble away 
probably more because that's a main route of access, not necessarily to help the friend, but more to allow their own troops to go inside. And then there's that. No, no, that's I don't know why I go next. It goes to the wrong photo. I'll get the next one up. Hang on there. Bear with me. I do apologize for not bringing these up quite as quick as I'd like to. And there's another one. So the same view again. That's a couple of uh, uh, Canadian pattern vehicles coming again and bulldozers. That's the view. So those buildings you can see there in the front. When I stop showing, you'll see those buildings in front of Mag now. And uh, that's that's there where they are. There's the exact view. So uh, tell us a bit about that side of the city, uh, Karine, because that's the, the, the western side there is what's the, that's there is history. Well, Caen was almost divided like three different cities, uh, and there was a wall around each part. Uh, there was a wall around the section of Caen, around the Abbey of the Women, where the wife of William the Conqueror is buried. Uh, there was one around a bigger wall uh, and a bigger section around the Chateau Church Saint-Pierre where Mag started earlier and the biggest part of the old center of the city. And there was another section uh, with a wall around the section of, uh, I mean, the Abbey of the Men and the section where, where we are now. Um, it was more religious in the Middle Ages, of course. It's interesting to... Um, one more time, note the old buildings in this section of the city of Caen because it was much more spared than the, the rest of the city we saw earlier. It was spared until uh, the Operation Chonwood because then they received more uh, air bombings and shelling. So they were kind of feeling like in safety inside the church and in the abbey until the last days before the liberation. And so there have been uh, quite a few bombs uh, when you're watching the picture uh, towards the church like this, right behind, if we were uh, with you, uh, with you, Mag, holding the telephone behind, there were big bomb craters and buildings that were destroyed the day before or, uh, on July the 7th uh, during mm. the air bombing, the artillery shelling before attacking. And uh, it's, um, there was um, a different behavior between the Canadians who arrived who were very excited or British like your uncle who wanted to go and see the tomb of William the Conqueror and the civilians who were uh, still stunned, who were not really understanding which was happening, was it really finished, uh, who were not so happy because they were still scared, they were still um, sad, uh, you know, concerned about their children. But um, this Marseillaise felt uh, nice. We talked about them singing the Marseillaise in the evening. It was good for, you know, uh, giving them some uh, hope, a better future and some strength. The mag is in front of the monument there, which, as you can see, although you can't see the text, those, text, those watching, it's the French flag on the left and the Canadian maple leaf on the right there. And that's acknowledging on the 9th of July, the, uh, the, the, the Canadian Armour Brigade and uh, the 9th Canadian Infantry Brigade arrived that area there. And uh, it commemorates that, that meeting of, of, of Canadian forces there. And they'd, they'd had an easier push into sit the city in terms of the rubble because the, the side they were coming in from was not quite as badly destroyed as the north where my great uncle came in from. But they were under that much more firepower because they're under the fire of the Germans still defending the area south of Carpecay Airport. There's still a lot of German units and artillery and self held guns there. So the Canadians have perhaps a more lively attack in terms of under fire. The British have to contend with the, the rubble. And the 59th Staffordshire Division are still dealing to the north of the city with remnants of the German defenders up there. So all three divisions had a ter terrible time. And we're going to be bringing this uh, show to an end fairly. So we've been an hour just, and a half now. I just wanted to add something short. Did, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. did you know, Paul, that there is a legend um, about the church of the Abbey of the Men um, telling that if ever the, the spires of the two towers of the facade uh, collapse, then the Kingdom of England collapses. Ah. Well, then, then, then they're, they're bound to collapse sooner because we're, we're, our, our country is rapidly going down um, <laughs> dire straits with various situations. I'm not going to politics now, but anyway, let's get let, let's. Um, Let's, I want to conclude some of my great uncle's story because I'm going to show a couple of photos again. So this, I showed this photo earlier, but I'll show it again. So there is my great uncle's platoon 
uh, in, in May 1944. So he'd lost several of those men in the battle fighting for Combon Plain. I think only 23 of those men began their day into uh, the city of Court on July the 9th. Eight were killed or wounded on that day. And uh, my great uncle himself was blown up in August. He was uh, approaching Chuan, just near where the cemetery is uh, in the little village. I, I've forgotten its name now. There's an archway there a couple of miles away from the middle of Troan. He was blown up by grenade and evacuated back to England. So his life as a platoon commander was two months of combat, which was probably about four times more than, than your life expectancy. They say the life expectancy of a platoon commander in Normandy campaign was about a week. Uh, by Vietnam, it drops to about two days, apparently. So my great uncle Cyril, doing two months, had outlived his life expectancy. But I want to show you another photo of the 2nd Battalion Royal Oster Rifles officers. And this one has been overlaid with poppies for those who lost their lives and um, crosses for those who are wounded, because it shows you and that's a famous photo because there's General Montgomery in the middle there. And you can see about 40 percent of the men in that photo were killed or wounded. So sometimes when people are thinking, oh, the British Army, the officers are always at the back drinking tea and keeping out the way. Well, absolutely not. The officers are, you know, a company's commander was killed on the morning of July the 8th. Um, so of those of that unit there, this is the, uh, within a short time of the Normandy campaign, 40% of them are killed or wounded. And indeed, when my great uncle came to reunions uh, after the war, he obviously often wasn't recognized by some of the officers because they had joined the unit after he'd been there. My great uncle had been with them since 43, all through the training in Northern Ireland and around England. He was with them in Normandy for two months. But of course, he wasn't there when they were fighting into Germany at the end of the war. So the officers didn't know who he was because you know he had left and he evacuated out. I mean, he survived and he died a few years ago. I'll show you a photo of my great uncle in Combon Plain. This is the last time I was with him in Normandy. I forget which year that was there. But that is him laying a wreath there in his light gray suit at Combon Plain to his battalion. And uh, he, before that ceremony, he'd been walking uh, us around where his foxholes were in the village. That was a month earlier, the Combon Plain um, battle. But he, he found that the times in Con very, very trying and very um, um, difficult because of the losing his men by this point. I've had a question. How old was I? I think he was 23. Uh, but on June the 6th, uh, so 23 in Normandy. And um, he, he served on as a territorial after war. He, he rose to the rank of major in the London Irish Rifles. So he switched from Royal Ulster's, the Northern Irish unit, to the London version. And uh, he's, if you're wondering where, I'll show that. I don't think I've still got the photo ready. I've still got the photo of the pharmacy, the famous one. Uh, I'll, I'll get it for you. Hang on, I'll keep on talking and I'll get the photo for you. But the, the, um, he was buried in his uniform. So his service dress, he's, he, he, that's, that's gone. But he's the helmet he was wearing in the photo that I will bring up again and show you one more time. I'm just finding it again. It's uh, gone somewhere again. Bear with me. Just getting there. So... The, I should have actually got this ready for what they call in a stage show and tell, but I didn't. It's downstairs in a cupboard, but the, where the hell has the photo gone again? But that helmet he's wearing there uh, in front of the cafe, uh, Pharmacy de Progrès, is downstairs in my cupboard. It was at, alas, it was painted a rather horrible gloss green paint after war, so it hasn't got its wartime shade. I should eventually uh, try and uh, restore it and get it back. So it's almost like brown color and you can see there the third division two rifle green strips indicating they are the intermediate brigade of the division he's black on green titles his officers pips is sten gun that's a sten mark three for the for the, for the weapons nerds and his sergeant has a sten mark two and that's that photo we saw earlier on the show so we're going to bring things to an end uh, fairly soon so we've been rabbiting away for an hour and 45 minutes. I've really enjoyed it though. I've, I've learned a lot from, from Karin. I knew the kind of battle things quite well, but I didn't know so much about the history of course. So thank you for that. So Gwen, um, where, where are you right now? And, and have you anything else you want to say before we, we close the show? Well, I'm just on the Vossel Bridge uh, where we ended up by the river. And uh, well, I will thank you everyone for watching. And thank you, uh, Karin and you and uh, Maga. But no, it's uh, just one anecdote. See, I, I happen to live right here beyond that building. 
and, and I'm doing some gardening at the moment. So I, I dig out a little bit in the backyards. And after a couple of inches of earth, I'm starting to dig out porcelain, shattered glasses, but very old one, and some leftover from a gravel. Um, last year, they did a building just on the other side of the prairie, and they started evacuating people because they still found ordinance. And it was just last year. Um, so it's an interesting city, which uh, I would say starts to get by with its past. It's a lively city to be in, but uh, still quite scarce. Uh, by what was uh, here. Yeah, and so, and Mag, have you got anything you want to say before we switch off? Well, I'm really pleased we get to know more about your great uncle's story, um, because I know how it makes so much difference in your life. Um, and so I'm pleased about that. Thank you, everybody. Well, thank you, Mag, for your, your camera work. And it's it's a bit weird walking through busy streets. Yes, filming. it is. <laughs> yeah, people look at you like you're a bad person. So you've done very yeah. well there. I have I have few dates now. So you've got a few dates of you. Okay, well, um, I'll expect you soon. But um, so thank you very much for your camera work, Mag. And thank you very much, uh, uh, Gwen, of course, as well. And um, we'll, we'll kind of conclude things. Hopefully, those watching, you've understood a little bit about the liberation of Colm that day. And... Um, it was a complicated procedure and, and a little bit more about the civilian experience, which is something a lot of the crusty old military war buffs who read all their books about um, World War II t tend to forget sometimes the collateral damage of the civilian population. And, uh, and we still are uncertain exactly how many French civilians were killed in, in the Battle of Normandy. You know, the figure, I think the lowest I think I've seen is 17,000. I think the highest I've seen is 30,000. So I think the truth is somewhere between those two. And uh, and that's and that's the whole of the Normandy campaign, as 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 it, uh, I think James Holland said once, in the, in the Operation Crossbow, all the pre-bombing of the rail links and the transport hubs of, of France before D-Day, so all the areas like Amiens and Rouen and those in Le Havre, that bombing alone was ten times greater than all the bombs dropped on London in the Blitz. It's one of those interesting bits of, of, of trivia that we think of the, the terrible bombing of London as being horrific, but we allies dropped 10 times as amount of bombs as the Germans dropped on London just on the transport hubs of France. All, it has to be said, with the blessing of the French government in exile in London, they kind of said, yes, it's okay to bomb. I don't know whether the, there was a bit of pressure put on. I think their arms pushed up behind their backs to say yes, but you know, de Gaulle and the government there realized that that, that knocking out France's transport was essential. So there'd been a lot of loss of life before even D-Day starts. And then D-Day begins and it gets worse and worse and worse. And uh, there was something with a Karine Nosey star. I was told this years ago, because when you are visited normally as like a Brit, you see the Commonwealth War Grave cemeteries, you see the American cemetery, but you don't really see the French ones because there's no communal cemetery of the dead from the war. They're mixed in with the, the conventional dead. and. And someone said to me once uh, that the legend is, is that if you say to a French person in Caen, La Havre, and you say, where are the French buried from the war? And they'll say, below your feet, monsieur, below your feet, because there are still bodies that haven't been recovered. We don't know how many, but cities like La Havre, and, and as Karim was explaining in Caen, of, of importance was to get amenities on for the living, to get electricity and power and fresh water and sewage. And that, unfortunately, was more important than digging through every last bit of brick to get every last civilian dead person out because there was needs to look after the living. So that, that's why the figure, or one of the reasons why the figure of civilian casualties is unknown because there are, there are, there are, there are victims that we don't know about. And, and Karin can jump in here as well, but every mayor of every village had to submit a report after the war about what had happened in their village, what had happened in terms of the occupation, the buildings, the requisitions by the Germans, how many people had been taken away on the service, travail obligataire, how many this, that and the other. But they could only talk about their own populations. A lot of these mayors didn't know what kind of people were moving through their communities, hiding from other parts of France. Uh, young men avoiding their service, so we don't know how many people were in Normandy who weren't actually part of Normandy's population. So they're, they're, some of them must have died in the bombing, and we don't know who they are. So a little village might come on plain, for example, the mayor could say, we lost the, the Leclercs and the Lavises, and they wouldn't have known what other people were sheltering there who may have been victims. The same would apply to cities like Caen and Le Havre. And that's why you have this huge margin of error of how many French were actually killed 
in the Battle of Nom. What's your feelings on the total, Karin, yourself? What's your research? Is it is it 17,000? Which, which is nearer to the truth, do you think? I think with 20,000, we're close to the truth. There has yeah. been uh, much better, you know, uh, uh, studies made recently and for the city of Caen by itself about 2,000. But you're right about the people who were not from Caen. From Normandy, there were lots of people who had left other regions or Paris, for example, to get sheltered in Normandy. And for them, it's hard to know. So it's uh, it's around 20,000 in total and 2,000 for Caen, yes. Well, Gwen says his battery is near down. So I just want Gwen to do a selfie so we can all see who Gwen is. So just, just rotate the camera on yourself. Then you can say goodnight. And then I'll do this. Everyone knows what Mag looks like. But just have a... Have a look at yourself, Gwen. There, there's Gwen. So everybody watching, thank Gwen for doing a great job. He's covered a, quite a few miles, uh, kilometers today. So thanks very much, Gwen. Uh, great work. And Mag as well. There's Mag. So um, thank you, Mag. Um, we'll see you later. And um, and thank you, Karine, of course. So um, people have seemed to enjoy the show. So we've talked about the uh, Mag's, Mag's dropping out now. So thanks, Mag. Thanks again, Gwen. Thanks again. We'll, we'll have you on another show in the future. Thank you. Go and see Morgan. Go and see your baby. So there we go. So it's just um, just Karine and, my, and myself now. So I will bring it to a to a, to an end now. So um, yeah. So any any closing remarks you'd like to say, Karine, as a as a as a someone who went to school in Con, grew up in the area. What would you like Americans and British and Canadians to watch this to know about your city? What what, what have you got? A simple message you'd like to say? Yes, what I would like everybody to think about is that it was an end and it was only the beginning. Uh, the end of um, the long battle to capture the city, or at least a part for the soldiers of the 30th Corps. Um, and they had gone through bloody battles and uh, they were already tired and had lost a lot of men. But they, they at last took the, at least uh, the old city. But it was just the beginning of uh, another battle and another battle, and it took many uh, other months before the, the war ended. For the people of Caen, it was also an end, the end of most of the air bombings and shillings because there were few others after. But it was also the beginning of other kinds of problems. The winter after um, the liberation was one of the coldest winters um, Europe ever had. And uh, there was not food enough for everybody. You know, people had less food um, after the liberation than during the German occupation. And yeah. many other people, there were almost as many people who died from starvation, or at least from the lack of food, from the cold temperatures and not having any decent place to get sheltered from the cold, uh, yeah. from fevers. And uh, so it was only one... Uh, stepped to uh, normal life but when you talk I talked with my grandparents my great uncles great aunts and all of the people of this generation um, they are they were telling because most of them are gone now they were telling as much uh, um, about the, this liberation in, in a positive way as much as in a negative way because for them it was this it was uh, all the best and all the worst, because it was just the beginning. But at least they knew that it could only get to a better life. And yeah. so that's and what we I forget, wanted you know, to Again, we, we'll, we'll wrap it up. And we, we forget when we're looking at the photos of the craters, you take areas like saint jean south of, of Caen and, and saint Tho, and you see all those craters. But that means those arable fields are impossible to be filled until all those craters have been filled in. And also the Germans during their occupation have been working the fields more than they should have been. You know, meant to, you know, rest the field every couple of years. In order to field, field, feed their army, they had been working those fields so that they, they were barren. They couldn't grow crops. So you got craters and fields that have got no nutrients left. So it took France's or well, Normandy's economy a good decade to, to build up to any level of, um, of, of where they'd been before the war. And in Britain as well, as, as Americans tend to forget that in Britain, we're still on food rationing until the 1950s and clothing rationing. I think finally some things came off in like 1959 or something. Whereas America, luckily because of their production, they've got boom time, the, you know, the baby boomers. They're, they're enjoying their luxuries, their Cadillacs and their, uh, their, 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 all the, pr the, the benefits of, of becoming a, a, a mechanized nation during the war. 
But for the people of occupied Europe who have now been liberated, it was a good 10 years of, of gradual recovery. And Denmark and Belgium and Norway and all that had to rebuild, refeed, uh, try and get their populations back. And Britain was, yes, I said, we were on rationing for years. Our economy in Britain was absolutely screwed by the war. We have to pay back our Lend-Lease debt to the USA, which we finally did about five years ago. The Mulberry Harbors cost us millions. Um, the French have no food. So it, the liberation, as Karine so wisely said, is, is the end of one chapter, but it's the beginning of another chapter of, of, of a different kind of battle, a battle against uh, uh, of the economy, a battle of against hardship, and um, so I think that's we've we've said enough now. Otherwise, we'll be um, we'll be just talking for hours now. So thank you, Kareen. It wasn't as bad as you thought it was going to be. You were great. Mag was great. Gwen was great. And um, so for those watching, please um, click subscribe, click the little bell to get notifications. I haven't put the announcement yet, but I'm doing an interview with Alan King, the Sherman Tank Drive in East Riding, Yeoman. We talked about him yesterday. I'm doing that 3 p.m. UK time, Saturday afternoon. I'm speaking to David O'Keefe, the Canadian author, tomorrow about our Operation Spring show that we're doing on July the 25th. We've got the Danish Denmark at War special coming up on the 24th. I want to do, before then, at least one or two San Lo shows, maybe get Joe Balkowski involved as well and do a similar show in the center of San Lo with camera teams going around showing what's there. So there's lots more stuff coming. I'm just stuck trying to get everything planned and rehearsed and, and also get other things done. So if you'd like to support what I'm doing here at World War II TV, the link to the Patreon page is down below. Please consider that. And, and the link to Karine's website. She's a tour guide. A bad year to go independent this year. Everyone's got no work this year. But when you come to normally next year, Karine can show you not just World War II stuff. She can do all the cultural stuff. And as you know, she knows can like the back of her hand mag and gwen are both guides as well so we're bringing you the we're, we're we're calling ourselves guide historians historians with a little h big h we all know our history so again thank you very much for watching thank you for kareen for joining us i'm going to end the stream now so um we'll see you again very shortly i'm paul woodhead for world war ii tv saying good night everybody i'm off because it's beer o'clock thank you very much bye bye Right, we're done. I see it's finished now. It's just you and I, Kimmy.